especially because of social media, about raising their heads above the parapet, about getting involved in a debate. Chair of the Justice Select Committee, Bob Neill. I want to try and bring our experience to you. Try and make something positive out of what was a, a, a bad experience for us as a family. All that after your news. And good evening to you. It is six o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The government is planning an extra evacuation flight from Sudan tomorrow for British nationals trying to leave the country. It will depart from the eastern city of Port Sudan, where earlier the first shipment of humanitarian aid arrived. Those hoping to leave the country are being told to get to the international airport there before midday. British Navy ships have also docked in Port Sudan to support evacuation efforts. However, the RSF paramilitary force says it will extend the truce for a further 72 hours from midnight tonight, although gunfire has been heard in Khartoum today, undermining the current ceasefire. The Nurses' Union has relaxed its strike rules to ensure critical services will still operate during a 28-hour walkout, which starts at 8 p.m. NHS England says discussions with the Royal College of Nursing have resulted in an agreement for minimum staffing levels to be provided to cover life and limb services after serious concerns were raised about patient safety. 54% of RCN members rejected the government's offer of a 5% pay rise. The public are being urged to use the service wisely and the Health Secretary is hopeful the dispute can be resolved later this week. Uh, the Staff Council is due to meet on Tuesday. I'm cautiously optimistic that the, uh, the Staff Council will agree uh, to then vote in favour of the deal. But I think it's right to wait until Tuesday for the Staff Council to meet. And this strike is premature. I think it's disrespectful to the other trade unions. I think the RCN should have waited. They're a member of the Staff Council. They were part of the negotiations. And as I say, Pat Cullen herself recommended this deal to her members. The former Prime Minister Liz Truss is contesting a government bill related to her use of the country house she had access to during her time as Foreign Secretary. Now, the Mail on Sunday has reported Ms Truss has been asked to pay back around £12,000 for costs incurred while she spent time at the Chevening Estate in Kent. Uh, Ms Truss says the invoice relates to official government business, though, rather than personal expenses, uh, but is happy to replace any items that are missing from the estate. The government has been approached for comment. A manhunt is ongoing in Texas for a gunman who killed five of his neighbours, including an eight-year-old boy, on Friday. Uh, police in Texas say the victims were shot dead when the family asked the suspect uh, to stop firing a semi-automatic weapon in his garden. Francisco Oropesa, who is Mexican, is believed to have fled the United States. The British Army has begun rehearsals for the coronation of King Charles. Soldiers from all divisions of the armed forces have been gathering at training areas across South London to prepare for what will be the biggest ceremonial event of their careers. Uh, soldiers have flown home from operational duties or training exercises from afar afield as Cyprus, Iraq, Kenya and Estonia to represent their regiments at the event. Meanwhile, the Stone of Destiny has been welcomed to England in a special ceremony ahead of the event. Now, it dates back to the 12th century. It's normally on display at Edinburgh Castle, but it will sit under the King's throne next week. It's been used in coronations for nearly a thousand years. TV online, DAB plus tune in radio, this is GB News. But now it is time for Gloria Meets. Conservative MP Bob Seeley elected in 2017 to represent the Isle of Wight. Uh, good to talk to you. We're going to talk about personal stuff and your life story uh, shortly. But yeah. I want to start because I'm interested in you trying to change the law as a backbench MP. There is a vehicle yeah. called the Private Members Bill to do it. It concerns the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry yeah. and Meghan. Tell me what you're trying to do and why. 
OK, I mean, there isn't enough time for members of parliament to change laws. And actually, we need a system, in my opinion, that's closer to the United States, where it's easier for backbench MPs from a whatever party to come in and bring in good ideas, because it makes the system work better if some laws can start from backbenchers and rather more than do today. Um, and there's a couple I brought in. The one that you're referring to, Gloria, is about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, which has been picked up quite widely, which is very nice of people. Um, look, if, if you're the Duke of Sussex or Duke and Duchess of Sussex, I just find it very uncomfortable, and I think a huge number of your viewers would agree, that you either respect the system, you have your titles, everyone sort of doffs their hat, especially in the US, you respect the system, you keep your titles, and either you play a positive role, as a lot of the royals do in this country, or you live quietly as individuals. But you can't trade and trash. You can't trade on your royal status whilst at the same time trashing it. And so I think, for me, I just think that's wrong. And there was a bill passed back in actually 1917 during World War I, where foreign princes um, who were grandkids of Queen Victoria could be stripped of their UK royal titles if, for example, they were fighting for the Germans in World War I. So it's not a great analogy for now, but what I'm trying to do is bring in some amendments to that bill just to say, right, we've got a bill that can strip um, royal princes of titles, which, which, regardless of which one it is, and we should amend that now so the Privy Council can strip princes, royal princes of titles, should the case be. Now, I'm not a, a Republican, some of my ancestors were, but I'm not a Republican. I think the monarchy actually plays a really important role, a valuable role. I thought the Queen was an extraordinary human being, had the privilege of meeting her once, I think she was absolutely wonderful. And actually, you see. It's almost like with her passing, you see what a remarkable figure she was. I think William and Kate doing a fantastic job. I think Princess Anne, I think they all do brilliant jobs. And they're really important, especially for the voluntary sector in this country. But you can't trade on your royal status and trash it at the same time. And that's something that I've got a problem with. And I suspect, Gloria, a lot of GB News listeners have got, a, uh, sorry, viewers have got a problem with it as well. Do you think they should have their titles removed? Because what you're yes. saying is you're going to... Well, I'm going to give people the choice. You know, I think if they want to carry... I personally think, yes, obviously I do. But actually, we just need to update the law. So if princes behave really badly, royal princes behave really badly, they can have their titles removed. What I'm doing is defending the good bits of a constitutional monarchy and saying, absolutely, you know, absolutely, let's keep it. But if you don't behave well, then actually you've got to think about whether you are... Uh, you have got the right stuff to be and to represent the royal family in whatever guys. How far along the process are you in getting that to become law? Well, it's funny you say that because uh, I'm actually got a meeting this week, I think tomorrow, with the clerks who are very kindly writing the bill. Realistically, I will present it. Realistically, there is sadly not that great a chance of it becoming law, but I'm putting it out there as a first reading. So in the months and years to come, if there is a mood in Parliament to change it, there is something on the stocks through which we can do so. Are you pleased Harry's coming to the coronation? I'm going to give you a French, very Gaulic shrug. You know, I, I, do, I, do I care either way? I'm not sure I really do, to be honest. I, I think the, the monarchy plays a really important role in our lives, but I think we may need to make sure that it continues to play that positive role, and that's what my bill is about. You know, some people say, or oh, they feel for Harry and Meghan, they say yeah. they've been treated unfairly, sort of almost... No, they haven't. They've been... Sorry. I mean, if you look at the coverage they had, we was, we bent over backwards to welcome them. Uh, and everyone felt hugely sympathetic to Harry for what he's been through. Actually, they've got such a huge outpouring of love. Uh, so I don't buy that. Sorry. OK. So much that is interesting about you. Lots of people say uh, politicians, they don't really have a not really had proper jobs or they don't have real life experience. From 2008 to 2017, you served in the British Armed Forces uh, on the Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and ISIS campaigns. The toughest moment. Um, I, I am, can be slightly naive sometimes. So the toughest pro moment probably sounds like I haven't got the greatest judgment. I was, um, it, was, uh, it was the ISIS campaign. And we were sitting there waiting for uh, a retake of a mountain called Sinjar Mountain. And we were helping out with the Kurdish Peshmerga forces, who I have a huge respect for. They were impressive people. Um, and we were a couple of hours, middle of the night, um, uh, weren't too far from the front line. Um, and suddenly I heard what sounded like sort of sparklers or something in the sky. And I thought, well, that sounds a bit nice. I wonder what that is. And then at that point, one of my colleagues shouted mortar. 
and slammed me to the ground uh, because uh, they obviously had a much better idea what a mortar, incoming mortar sounds like. Um, but apparently that is the sound of a mortar when it's coming a bit too close for comfort. I mean, it landed 50 yards away. It wasn't too bad and the shrapnel went elsewhere. But um, yeah, I had a similar experience in Iraq when we were out hunting the rocket attack teams and we were in some boats in the Basra marshes. Um, and again, you sort of heard this sort of crackling sound in the sky. And I thought, well, what, you know, what? and I thought it was Eid festivities. And then sadly, I realized that we were coming under uh, rocket attack. Um, again, luckily, you know, nobody was killed. But um, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for your service to the, to, to the country. My pleasure. My pleasure. I was a very accidental soldier. I mean, I was, I was going to go and do it properly when I was 18, 19, did my bit before the regular commission board, then decided against it because I don't want to go and live in Germany because that's where the tank regiment I would have served with. And then I joined as a uh, just a private and then a you know non, a very junior NCO um, and got uh, mobilised to go to Iraq and a fantastic tour. So I was a very accidental soldier, but I did love my time. I did 10 years and actually uh, I really recommend it. Something else that's interesting about uh, you is that you spent some time in the Soviet Union when mm -hmm. you were... Young, in your 20s? Even younger. I've done everything in the wrong order in my life, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I was a stringer for the Times, actually, and for the Washington Post. And I went out there when I was, I think, just 21. Um, and I went there on an educational holiday because I've been working as a journal, had some money for the first time in my life. And I thought, I, I can either go and lie on a beach in Tunisia or I can go off to West Ukraine, and, uh, which was then in the Soviet Union. And David Alton, very well-known liberal MP, now very well-known peer, does great work on human rights stuff, proper human rights. You know, he's a real advocate and champion, especially in places like Hong Kong and elsewhere. And his assistant, who was a mate of mine at the time when David Alton was an MP, said, go to West Ukraine because you're going to meet priests there who are being sent to the Chernobyl cleanup operation without protective clothing. So they all get cancer and die. And I thought as a young man, 20 year old, who'd been brought up during the Cold War, you know, always wondering whether we were all gonna get killed in a nuclear war, you know, of that generation. I thought that's really fascinating. And I thought, I was really curious about life. And so I thought, okay, I'm, I've never been to the Soviet Union. I wanna find out if Ronald Reagan is right, if it is this great evil empire. He was right, it was, it was an evil empire, no question about it. Um, and I went out there and I met all these priests and I rocked up in a place called Lviv, a city in Western Ukraine, in the first Easter that the, the Soviet regime and Gorbachev had um, allowed them to practice Christianity openly and to celebrate Easter openly. And all these little old babushkas and little old ladies all look like my mum, because my mum sort of, sort of comes from that part of the world as well. All these little old ladies turned up with their beautiful little painted um, eggs, which are real eggs, not sort of plastic eggs, but sort of real eggs, which they painted in these little wicker baskets. And they'd come in from the villages around Lviv, and it was just uh, the colours and the sounds of all these little pocket baroque cathedrals in Lviv will stay with me forever. And then I went off to Kiev, did some uh, freelancing, and then the time said, do you want to go back there permanently? And I had uh, three and a half, four years of um, travelling around the, the Soviet Union, post-Soviet states having uh, lots of adventures. And I have to say it was one of the, you know, I've had, I'm lucky, I've had three fantastic jobs in my life, and that was one of them. Yeah. And your fantastic job now, because we're assuming that. Yeah, 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 no, that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, this, is, this is number three of that. And I hope my last fantastic job, you know. We'll see, we'll see. Um, you represent a beautiful part of the world. I do, You're I'm very a member lucky. of parliament for the Isle of Wight, mm -hmm. because it is so beautiful. It is fabulous. There are lots of wealthy people yep. from outside the Isle of Wight yep. who think, I'll have a bit of that, please. Yeah. I'll have my second home there. Okay. Sh I'm sure that has uh, challenges, but yeah. also some, some, some merit too. But should they pay a bit more? Yes, they do. I, I don't think they should next... It, it depends where you are and your pressures. So I, I think I, um, our anti-Tory coalition councillors said, we want to pay them, everyone pay the maximum amount. It's up for our councillors to decide the amount. So I do think they should pay more. How much more is, is open for debate? Look, there are some communities, you go to a place like Seaview, 80% um, second home. That is painful because outside, and that's traditional that people then, it's very heavily packed in summer. It's gorgeous. And, you know, yeah. The, 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 the sailing beautiful. club there, the yacht club there is fantastic. They also do really good work with our local schools to make sure that the kids who would, you know, would never normally go sailing come through there. So there's a lot of good that happens in that community. But when you have a community that is pretty deserted outside the holiday season, it is bad for that community. And Yarmouth, again, in the West White near where I live, it's sort of 40% second home and Bembridge also. So there are some communities on the island like Cornwall, like Dorset, like Devon that have high second home owners and that can have a really damaging impact but second homeowners can also bring really important life experience 
uh, and contacts and wealth and money and ideas. And a lot of them, especially as they get older, tend to base themselves on the island. And the London pad becomes somewhere they occasionally go as their lives then gravitate towards the island. So it is complex. But for sure, they should pay more. But for sure, we need to look after islanders. One of the reasons I led my planning revolt, revolt was that we needed exceptional circumstance. We needed to be able to, for places like the Isle of Wight, to plead that we have a unique case because we're an island and actually build housing for islanders. So that's been my priority. OK, final question. And I was hurrying you because I didn't want this final question to slip off. OK. You are a single man in politics. Yes. How on earth do you date? I do, actually. I manage. I mean, I have avoiding um, dating apps, but I mean, you tell me that some MPs do it. Maybe I should. I don't know. I, um, it's working out so OK so, so far. <laughs> Touch what I'm looking for some wood. I don't want to lean too far over. Um, actually, there's some there, isn't there? Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. But uh, I manage it just about. <laughs> Bob Seeley, thank you very much. That was wide ranging. It, it was fun and it was really interesting. Thank you, Bob Seeley. Thank you. Coming up, ex-Labour MP Ruth Anderson. Uh, I never travelled alone. Um, I wasn't allowed on public transport for three years by myself. I had to move home in London um, on the advice of the police because they weren't confident they could secu secure my old house. Like, everything changed. Coming up, Chair of the Justice Select Committee, Bob Neill. It's unacceptable that people are waiting for trials to be heard some two years or sometimes more after the event. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
Ruth Anderson, you were Ruth Smith, uh, the Labour MP, uh, until that last general election. Now, I said to you when we were organised this interview, I wanted to talk to you about your experience of being a Jewish Labour MP during a very difficult period, and you pulled me up on that and said, I'm not just a Jewish Labour MP. Tell me why you pulled me up on that. I think it's the one thing I really resent, and I said it to Corbyn at the time, that he would rue the day that he made me a Jewish Member of Parliament. Because up until that, I've been campaigning for the Labour Party. I've been part of the Labour Party my whole life. I come from a family a part that's part of the Labour movement. It's who we are, it's what we were. I door knocked for the first time during the 92 general election when I was 11. Like this was just who I was. And I'd never been a Jewish anything. I was a Labour activist. I was a feminist. I was a Brit who happened, all of those things, who happened to be Jewish. And suddenly, from 2016 onwards, the only bit of my identity that seemed relevant for certain people was the fact I also happened to be Jewish. And I can't tell you how much I resented it. Not because I'm Jewish, that I am so proud of, but because they turned it on its head and they made that as if that was all I was. And I wasn't. All of my friends, like, you didn't care that I was Jewish. Like, I think I'm not even sure you would have thought about the fact I was Jewish. Mm. I was a mate. Yeah. Like it was not, yeah. You know, I'm not even sure I knew that you were Jewish actually no. before the whole anti-Semitism. Yeah. I was thing. someone who's always been around, who'd campaigned, who'd been part of the trade union movement. And then these people decided that that was the only thing I was. I wasn't. I was a member of parliament in my own right. I was someone that cared about national security and defence, that was campaigning on holiday hunger um, before Marcus Rashford. Uh, yeah, it was all of the things that who I was. And then they decided that there was one thing that was relevant to me and worse than they made that thing, a political football, and changed my life beyond all recognition. And it would have been so easy to stop. So that's why, you know, I'm adamant also at this point, I've got a new life, right? Like that had to be, it was part of the name change too. Last chapter, new chapter. But I was just so, how dare they? So when the Labour Party went through this period, yeah. when it was mired in allegations of anti-Semitism, you said that that period changed your life. I just wondered how it impacted you. On a, did it impact you on a daily basis? In your own words. So um, it's easy to just think about this as sort of moments of crisis, and especially after the 20, after 2018 into 2019, when it was sort of a daily occurrence. But actually... For me, everything changed on the 30th of June, 2016. Now, prior to that, I had raised that, the issues of anti-Semitism with, um, with Corbyn and the leadership nearly every week from January, 2016. Um, I was vice chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party. I had a meeting with Corbyn and with others, parliamentary committee, um, every week and was raising the fact that there was issues. We'd already had the investigation into what was happening, the Jam Royal investigation into what was happening at Oxford Labour Club. And so anti-Semitism was a thing, which is why Shami Chakrabarti had been brought in. And then there was the launch of the Shami Chakrabarti report and my interactions and what happened at the event, which the repercussions of that changed my Just life beyond that. Just explain what happened at that event. So, so the Labour Party held... Um, an investigation, really, into anti-Semitism within the Labour Party. It was commissioned by the leader of the, the then leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Shami Chakrabarti announced the findings at a press conference. You were in the audience. I was in the audience. I was invited. I had participated. I've been interviewed by Chakrabarti, and I um, and the leader's office had invited me to, and had requested my presence. Vice Chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party, Jewish MP. I arrived very early in the morning. It was really weird. I mean, context is always everything, right? So this was June 2016. We just had the Brexit referendum. And um, on the Monday of that week, many people had resigned from, including me, had refused to serve Jeremy Corbyn going forward for lots of different reasons. Actually, on that Monday, when I resigned, I refused to publish my letter. I was the only one of us, those of us who resigned because I'd said I couldn't serve him based on anti-Semitism anymore. But I also had put in, I know how damaging it would be if I published this letter. Little did I realise what was going to happen later that week. So I was at the launch of the event. Corbyn staff had turned it into a, uh, tried to turn it into a rally for Corbyn. So you'd sort of assume that an event to talk about anti-Semitism 
and how the Labour Party was going to tackle anti-Semitism was have lots of Jews present and would be a very serious, responsible thing. And actually, there were loads of people that were just there as Jeremy Corbyn supporters. And it had a really toxic feel before it started. It was, there was something in the air, you know, when you walk into a certain room and there's something really odd. Anyway, I was sitting in front of journalists, journalists behind me, man came up and was handing out leaflets. And I repeat, context is everything. We'd lost Joe Cox two weeks before. You'll remember the person that murdered her, assassinated her, shouted traitor as they were, as they attacked her. Um, and someone started handing out leaflets calling the Parliamentary Labour Party traitors um, and came up and refused to give me one but was handing them out to journalists. And I went, excuse me. And uh, they said, well, no, we're not giving it to you. And um, a journalist behind me said, she's a Jewish MP at an event about anti-Semitism. Give her the leaflet and he refused to. He went, oh, but she's a Jewish member of parliament. What's her name? And he took out a book and wrote down my name. Now claims he doesn't know I was. And I was wearing a very prominent star shape. Claims he didn't know I was Jewish. Nonsense. Um, anyway, one of the journalists passed me um, a copy of the press release um, just so I could read it. Like it wasn't, I took a photo of it, read it. Um, and then we got, Shami did her thing. Uh, Corbyn was there to answer questions too. Um, and the person that had been handing out this leaflet press release was called to ask a question and um, uh, and accused me of working hand in hand with the Telegraph, which in theory would be normal, like whatever. But we're at an event talking about anti-Semitism in the book that had just been handed out, the report where it says, accusing Jews of working with the media. Here's an anti-Semitic trope. Well, it definitely is when you're talking in that environment, in that space, talking about what Jews had experienced in the Labour Party. I stood up and said, how dare you? Corbyn and Chakrabarti said nothing. And the rest of the room turned on me and started shouting at me. And you walked out. And I you? walked out. And I was really upset. Um, it was a national news story. And I got my first substantive death threats that night. So life changed immediately. And death threats became a fact of your life, didn't they? Normal part of life. I mean, it's really easy to say, like, at the time, and you know, like, it's just normal, like, all right, I've had another death threat. Um, but normal life was different. And the bit that was really worse, this is, I know you, there are bits of this, like, got to engage and embrace the dark humour. Um, but I had, I was wearing an, an Apple Watch. I'm sure I'm not meant to say the brand, but never mind. Um, and at that point, all of my Twitter notifications came up. So actually, the death threats and abuse and horrible stuff was physically coming onto my body. Like, it sounds like a really, yeah. yeah, I've never been able to wear it again. And so from that point on, uh, I never traveled alone. Um, I wasn't allowed on public transport for three years by myself. I had to move home in London um, on the advice of the police because they weren't confident they could secu secure my old house. Like, everything changed. And some of it, you'll really appreciate, it's really difficult being a member of parliament and not being able to tell people where you're going. So, you know, my, there was a police officer at every surgery, which must have been awful for some of the people who were coming to see me. It wasn't fair, not for, you know, not only for me, but for the people that I was representing. It was really, it was really tough. And being the job of, you know, being an MP is long hours and you just power through. And I don't think you realise till you're through the other sides, what damage was done and the impact on those people that love you too. Because I just, you know, this was about me. So I just kept going about, oh my God, what I put my staff through, what I put my mum through. Anyone that loved me sort of was living and breathing this and couldn't do anything about it. More from Ruth Anderson after the break. This is sad and miserable and takes us back to a place I don't want to be in. We need to find a way through this. We need to find a way through where there is a level of dignity for Diane too.
I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Moves. Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair no, of jeans? No. <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I have completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's, I don't think it's controversial to say that Keir Starmer made it one of his priorities to... Oh, the man's a mensch. <laughs> What's a mensch? He's a good man. <laughs> it's Yiddish for a very good man. He is a very good man. Um, so this week, yeah. Diane Abbott has been accused of being anti-Semitic. She has been, she's lost the Labour whip just mm. this week. How did you feel when you read... When you read the this, this, this story, oh, so sad, and it's so thoroughly depressing on every level. Diane Abbott, regardless, we're not on the same wing of the Labour Party. She is friends with lots of people who have made my life quite difficult. But she was also the first black woman to be elected. She is an icon in her own lifetime. That is an extraordinary thing. I don't want her political career to end like this. I find all of this so sad, and honestly. I'm tired of my identity being used as a political football within the party that I have dedicated my life to. I'm just sad. I know that is, a ch we need to move on from this chapter. I want us to be talking about how we form government. I want us to be talking about how we beat the Tories. I want us to be talking about how we're gonna fix the communities that I live in in Stoke. I, you know, how we're gonna win back your old seat and my old seat. I want us to provide a level of hope for the future for the country. This is sad and miserable and takes us back to a place I don't want to be in. We need to find a way through this. We need to find a way through where there is a level of dignity for Diane too, because it's really important for her community and there is no hierarchy of racism. Racism is racism. She has had horrible experiences. I want everybody just to move forward and we're meant to be on the same side. And she did swiftly apologise. I should, I, should, I should say that. 
uh, shortly after, a few months after, he became chief executive of the Index on Censorship. This is an organisation which campaigns for freedom of speech. You still yeah. hold that role now. Is freedom of speech really under threat? So, yes, both... Yes and no. Like, where we live, we're really lucky and we need to cherish the rights that we've got. And one of my big frustrations is actually about self-censorship. There is a huge amount and number of issues where I think lots of people feel really uncomfortable, especially because of social media, about raising their head above the parapet, about getting involved in a debate, about having an argument, um, especially if they're not 100% sure of their facts because the world just lands on top of you, right? So why on earth would anyone volunteer for that? So I completely appreciate why they might, might not want to, but it does mean that our national conversation is polarised and all we hear from is the extremes and not the moderate middle. And this country is moderate. This country votes for moderates. This country just wants a nice life. Like our electorate are quite clear on the things that matter to them. And typically it's about them and their families and their life experiences and what they're gonna have. They don't care about some of the issues. And so they're not gonna get involved in them. So we're seeing a lot of self-censorship and that really worries me. And when you add that to, from a political point of view, this anti-woke nonsense that we're seeing, I thoroughly resent, I can't tell you how annoyed and angry it, get, it makes me, that people on the political right have tried to claim and own the idea of freedom of speech. Like, I've got the right to say whatever I want to, even if it offends you. Yes, you have, but actually every single progressive change in the UK, whether it's the you know, Equality Act, whether it's um, gay marriage, whether whatever it is, the right for women to vote, all of those things came from progressive campaigns where people utilised and claimed their freedom of speech, of association, of their right to protest. Those are progressive values. We cherish them, we hold on to them. And the left needs to remember how we got what we got and we need to fight and defend free expression and we need to reclaim it. And I think that's part of this conversation. So we're really lucky, but you've always got to protect what you've got, right? Ruth Anderson, it's the first time you've you've done the channel, and I think people will really enjoy listening to you. Find some of it hard because you you talked about your lived experience through a dev very difficult period, but I think it's going to be a great watch. Thank you. Pleasure. Coming up, Bob Neal. As well as having the highest rates of imprisonment, we also have some of the highest rates of reoffending. So it's clearly not joining up together. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Bob Neil. Uh, Conservative MP since 2006. You've got a big job. You're chair of the Justice Select Committee. And I'd like to spend a lot of time in this interview talking about your views on the criminal justice system, prison, crime. But I just want to start by asking you, there's a couple of things that I noticed you've been campaigning on uh, recently. Stroke care and saving the English National Opera. Tell me about why they're important to you. Well, they're... Um very personal things, um, Laura, because my wife um, is a professional singer, but sadly three years ago she had a stroke. Uh, and out of our family's experience, it struck me that we're, we're great with the NHS about the life-saving uh, bits of the system, but we're nothing like so good about the follow-up uh, and the stroke care. And uh, we found Anne Louise's voice was affected and some other uh, problems, which unfortunately impacted on her career. Uh, but we struggled to get through the system to get the therapy uh, and the support that she needed. And uh, the people we met in hospital were in a much harder position, much less well-placed to navigate the system than we were. So we'd just like to try and make that better. And it's a cross-party campaign that we've got. We set up an all-party parliamentary group for stroke. Surprisingly, there wasn't one uh, until a couple of years ago. And I've done it with Margaret Wheeler, who's a Labour peer, um, whose uh, husband has also been through uh, that problem. So we're trying to just to raise the whole issue uh, about both mechanical thrombectomy, which can uh, greatly reduce the amount of disability that stroke survivors have, if you can get it done in time, and also the need for a much better workforce to deal with uh, physiotherapists, uh, um, uh, speech and language therapists, where we've got a real shortage, and those things. So that's a campaign that I think is important that, that I want to try and bring our experience to. Try and make something positive out of what was a, a, a bad experience for us as a family. And then English National Opera, well, partly that connection. It's, my, being, my big interest outside politics has always been music and the theatre and opera. Um, uh, ENO does a brilliant job. It's the most accessible of our companies. And I think the Arts Council completely lost the plot in cutting their funding. It actually means that people, both in London and elsewhere, will get less good opera. And I want, you know, I was a, a lad from a semi-detached house in Hornchurch, didn't have any background in serious sort of high art, um, but I was hooked uh, on opera when I got to see it. Oh, on, on ITV years ago, an excerpt from Tosca. Um, and then I, I used to go up in the gods as a student. And I want more people to be able to do that. And obviously with Anne Louise's background, that's something I'm passionate about. And again, we've been working on a cross-party basis. People like uh, Harriet Harmer, Margaret Hodge uh, on the Labour side. And I hope we'll be getting it up the agenda. And I hope we'll be able to persuade the Arts Council to say, look, we got this one wrong and we need to row back from the amount of cuts that are actually threatening the whole existence of the company. Do you have to care for Louise and your wife Louise in any way since the stroke? Well, we, we are fortunately able uh, to, 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 to afford care and help, but she does need uh, care. And again, that's a real strain for many uh, people. Uh, we are better placed uh, financially uh, otherwise uh, than others, um, but it shouldn't have to depend uh, upon that uh, lottery of either what your income is or, or uh, where you live, the postcode sort of lottery that you can get for care as well. So that's why I think it's important uh, that, that we keep this up the agenda. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the big job that you have, Chair of the Justice uh, Select Committee, holding the government to account. It's cross-party uh, with the Conservative, the government majority, of course. Um, we have just got a new Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk. What should his number one priority be? Well, I mean, Alex is a very good appointment, if I, if I might say, um, he's, because he's got a serious experience in uh, the justice system. He was a barrister um, for a number of years, 
before he became an MP and specialised in criminal work. So I think the priorities Alex has got to tackle immediately are the nuts and bolts of the system. Uh, and that's first of all, uh, delays in the courts. Uh, we've got a serious crisis with delays in the courts. Uh, that's a question of backlogs that existed even before the pandemic, uh, but were made worse. Uh, we have too many courtrooms which are out of operation because of poor maintenance. I think he needs to increase the budget there. It's unacceptable that people are waiting for trials to be heard some two years or sometimes more after the event. It's unfair on the witnesses, uh, potential victims. It's also unfair on defendants uh, as well. Uh, and it makes for worse outcomes. That's got to be a top priority. That, that also means making sure that we're paying the barristers and solicitors who act in the justice system properly. Uh, and we know we had disputes in the past where barristers were refusing to take cases. Alex has got to rebuild bridges with uh, the legal profession and the judiciary because we can't work without them. Second big priority is overcrowding in our prisons. Uh, we're creaking at the seams already. Uh, if we're recruiting 20,000 more police officers, that's going to put more pressure on the system. Does prison work? Does it cut crime? It doesn't effectively all the time. Um, and the second thing that Alex has to tackle is uh, the state of our prisons. Uh, they're overcrowded uh, and many, particularly the older Victorian ones, are in a poor condition. We've also got real problems with retaining uh, experienced prison officers. If you don't have a good workforce, it's harder to keep order in prisons. And it's also harder to turn around those prisoners who are going to come out and you want them to come out in a better state than when they came in. And very often they're issues with drug addiction, mental health, very poor education. Um, uh, many have been in care in the past. Um, it, it's a, a, a vicious circle that they've fallen into. Now, if we're going to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system, we've got to find better means of dealing with those people. At the moment, we uh, incarcerate a higher percentage of, our pop uh, of the prison population uh, than any other a country in Western Europe, one of, the one of the highest incarceration rates. You think that's too high? Do we uh, send too many well, people to prison in I your think, view? I think we do, and that doesn't mean that there aren't some. You have to. Prisons for the dangerous people, prisons for the people who are a threat, not necessarily the best place for people who we're annoyed with, uh, and who are a nuisance and maybe low-level repeat offenders, we've got to find better means of dealing with them, perhaps with tagging involved, as well as much more robust community sentences, and also tackling all those issues as to what, you know, earlier on before they get into the system beforehand. Because we, as well as having the highest rates of imprisonment, we also have some of the highest rates of reoffending. So it's clearly not joining up together. When people look at the justice system, one of the areas they often highlight is rape conviction rates. Mm. Cases up, reported cases up, yeah. conviction rates are, are, sh are shameful, mm. really. Is there any fix that you could recommend to get that figure up? Sure, it's not easy, but do you have any ideas? Well, we looked at it as a select committee on, on, on more than one occasion, and it is difficult. Um, uh, I, I practised at the, the criminal bar, as you know, Gloria, for um, 25 years before I came into Parliament. I used to both prosecute and defend uh, in rape and serious sexual offences, as, as well as uh, many others. I think the thing to bear in mind is you've got to have sufficient evidence, first of all, to bring the charges. And I think a lot of the problems are at the evidence gathering stage. The statistics show, interestingly, that when you get the case in front of a jury, the conviction rates for rape and serious sexual offences are about the same as other offences of violence uh, against the person, GBHs and so on. But what we fail on is actually getting it in front of the jury to start with. And that's because either the evidence isn't uh, gathered sufficiently or isn't in good enough order for the Crown Prosecution Service to justify the charges. It has to meet the standard test uh, that there's a realistic prospect of conviction. And maybe that's because in the investigation process, we still don't treat complainants well enough. We don't always give them enough support. Uh, and because of the delays that we were talking about, very often, if it's going to be months and years uh, before the case comes to trial, um, the person who's been through that dreadful experience drops out of the process. They don't, get, don't want to go on with it anymore because it's a, it's a permanent reminder over their lives and they want to move on. So getting those cases done quickly is really important, I think, to improving uh, the conviction rates. But you, of course, you only want people convicted where there's good evidence to prove it. But you've got to help um, the witnesses uh, to do their best to give that evidence. And those delays and other problems get in the way of that. 
And the reason why we have this new Justice Secretary, and you've given him lots of advice, is because Dominic Raab has resigned uh, following the inquiry, the independent inquiry into whether or not he bullied some civil servants. Does Alex Chalk need to give him a bit of love? I think, so I, I was a minister at a much more lowly level for a time, um, and I really valued the civil servants. And I think having a good professional relationship with your civil servants is absolutely essential. So, yeah, there's nothing, there's no harm in giving a bit of a hug to people, but that doesn't mean you can't be demanding as well. Um, I can think of ministers who have been very demanding, uh, but you can do it in a way, I think, uh, where you know that even if you're saying, that really, really, I think we need to do this differently, that, that's not enough, I need more than that. But you can do that in a way, I think, which encourages them to do better. And that's what I think uh, we've got to do. I think Alex, as a character and a personality, will do that very well. The big uh, issue uh, in politics at the moment, and perhaps it's never been far from being near the top of the political agenda in recent years, is illegal immigration and how to combat it. Suella Braverman, she talks really tough. She wants to act really tough on combating illegal immigration. Who doesn't want to stop illegal immigration? Is she doing the right things to stop illegal immigration? Will her policies, plans, what she wants to do, will it work? Will it do the job? You see, I'm afraid, Laura, and I, I don't, I'm not convinced that they will, uh, because a lot of the emphasis has been on changing the law, on legislative solutions. And I don't think that's where the issue lies, actually. Um, the real problem uh, is that the system doesn't work efficiently enough. Uh, we're not getting uh, a system where people who come in uh, are potentially unlawfully I've got through the immigration tribunal and asylum system quickly, where decisions are made quickly, and they are then, when they don't have a right to be here, removed quickly. And frankly, it's the administrative failures of the Home Office that are to blame. And that's happened under successive Home Secretaries, going back over years. But frankly, the Home Office is not efficient. Uh, and uh, we need, rather than worrying about changing legal tests, none of that will matter if you haven't got, uh, firstly, enough people to do the investigations, so they will put more resource into that. Secondly, you need to get the quality of the investigations uh, up and running so that you can have the hearings quickly. I've got a friend who sits as a part-time um, immigration tribunal judge, actually uh, in the southeast of England, so or where the pressures really are. He was only asked to sit five times last year. There wasn't enough work. And why was that? Because the Home Office didn't have the cases ready to bring before the tribunal. I suggest the most important thing is to get that sort of thing right so you can get a decision, yay or nay, quickly, and then you have to have a sensible arrangement with France and our neighbours for returns. We've got to have a proper returns policy. And when we left the EU and the Dublin Convention, we didn't do anything to fill in the gap. So those are things, the things that I think will make a, a difference. That actually requires a more emollient approach to our working with our European partners rather than the blame game. It also requires actually putting some money into the system uh, rather than juggling around legal tests, which might make headlines, but aren't actually going to get the numbers processed through and people who shouldn't be here out of the country more quickly. Final question. Listening to you, some people will think, and you can refute the uh, characterization if you are, that you're quite liberal. You're, 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 you're a liberal conservative. Um, if you accept that, whether you accept it or not, who is your political hero? Um, I, I, I'm happy to accept it because, uh, because I'm, I'm quite proud of being somebody who believes in free markets and a free economy and traditional institutions. So I'm very traditional conservative in that way. But I do think also the Conservative Party needs to reflect the society in which we now live. And that's what we've always tried to do. And that's, I suppose, if I had a political hero, it would probably be um, Harold Macmillan. Um, when I started getting interested in uh, politics and history at school, Macmillan was, of course, still alive. I only met him once. Um, and he was a classic example of that One Nation Conservative, which I make no bones about being, um, who was quite tough and, and a really skillful political operator, but also was a pragmatist and thought the Conservative Party did best you know, in the middle ground. Funny enough, of course, he was also MP for Bromley, which is a, a part of my constituency. So plenty of reasons, I think, for me to, to think Harold Macmillan is a, the person that has influenced my thinking, probably, in practical terms more than anyone. So, Bob Neal, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks for tuning in. Join me again next Sunday at 6 for Gloria Meets.
Hello and welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Marco Pitania. Showers will gradually fade across the UK over the next couple of days. The weather will become quite fine for a time around the middle of the week before wet and windy weather arise from the southwest later. Low pressure is moving off the scene now, allowing a ridge of high pressure to build in, certainly through Tuesday and Wednesday, before wet and windy weather arise as low pressure arise from the southwest through Thursday and Friday. Back to the detail for the overnight period now though, and showers are gradually transferring the wave from west to east as we go through the overnight period, so becoming more focused towards the north and east of the UK during the early hours of Monday. Fewer showers then out towards the west later in the night, some clearer spells here, and turning a bit chilly across some rural spots across those western spots could dip into low single figures in one or two very rural uh, locations, but out towards the north and east, generally temperatures holding up with the cloud and the showers. And certainly a pretty showery picture as we go into Bank Holiday Monday across central Eastern parts of England, one or two quite heavy showers, could be the odd thunderstorm around too, and some showery rain also working its way in from the north across mainland Scotland. So once again, the best of the sunshine, with a much better day unfolding out across Northern Ireland, Wales and the southwest of England. In the sunshine, temperatures climbing into the high teens, could see 18 or 19 degrees down towards the southeast, 19 is 66 in Fahrenheit, but quite chilly up towards the far northeast. Overnight Monday into Tuesday, showers continue across those northern and far eastern areas, but out towards the west with high pressure starting to build in, it's a quieter picture, there'll be some clear spells, and again turning a little bit chilly in some rural spots, but on the whole just temperatures are not causing any issues. Into Tuesday itself, one or two showers are still possible across the far north and across the far east of the UK, but elsewhere it's a pretty good day actually with high pressure generally dominating, lots of sunshine around, some pa pa patchy cloud in places, but on the whole a pretty decent day and temperatures once again climbing into the mid to high teens in places, but still quite chilly up towards the far northeast of Scotland where temperatures will struggle here. Uh, pretty good conditions still on Wednesday, but we will start to see some rain moving in from the southwest and turning windier from the southwest too later this week.